board of the ICA and for many, many years has been a strong supporter of international links. Mid counties are one of the largest independent consumer co-ops in the UK. We have over 700,000 members and over 500 trading sites. I think it's fair to say within the UK, the cooperative movement supports, encourages a commitment to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. These goals are core to all our business activities, whatever type of cooperative we may represent. Working in collaboration with our members and our key stakeholders, we firmly believe there are cooperative solutions to achieving these goals. And within the UK itself, the co-op movement is extremely strong. There's over 7,000 independent cooperatives, a combined turnover of 38 billion last year, and some 13 million active members. So turning to today's session, it will hopefully demonstrate the importance of cooperation and indeed cooperatives to deliver more than just profit through the value or the supply chain. I guess many people, many consumers, many producers, and indeed many cooperators understand a part that cooperatives play at the beginning of this supply chain. Or perhaps how it manages storage through secondary cooperatives. But it's perhaps not appreciated as well the part cooperatives can play throughout the integrated supply chain, from small producer through secondary storage through to the end consumer. And cooperatives should play their part something more fundamental than just profits at all these stages. Working together on an international basis, we can, and indeed we should, promote responsible consumption and production to help ensure the long-term sustainability of businesses, as well as ensuring responsible consumption amongst the generation coming through. And this cooperative approach, I'm convinced, can make a real impact and a real difference to all of the sustainable development goals, but particularly the topic we're here today to talk about, sustainable development goal 12, responsible consumption, and responsible production. Within mid-counties, we've taken the lead on responsible consumption. We've introduced a system called Happily, which ensures transparency to end users of exactly where their food is coming from. And it's probably right at this point to mention the 25th anniversary of Fair Trade. Ed Mayo, Secretary General of Co-ops UK, was fundamental in setting up Fair Trade 25 years ago. And I think Fair Trade is one of the themes I've heard throughout this conference, and again, we'll talk about today. Our support collectively for Fair Trade for the last 25 years has helped Fair Trade producers to be brought to the market. It's ensured better prices, better working conditions, local sustainability, and importantly, fair terms of trade for farmers and workers in the development world. It's a great example of how cooperatives are working together throughout the value or supply chain to help deliver the UN Sustainable Development Goals. I'm proud that mid-counties, I'm proud that the UK movement, and I'm proud that internationally, we are playing our part. But we should be able to do more, and that's what today's session is really about. And I'm delighted today we have a range of speakers to discuss this topic. Individually, they bring a great wealth of experience and insight. And I really do think we can tell a coordinated story of how cooperatives can play a part throughout this value chain. What else we can do? We'll start the story from a global scale and work our way through to individual producers. So to start with the panel, I'm delighted to introduce Hanego Abasari Landazabel, who's worked for more than 20 years as part of Mondragon. He's now in charge of communication and public affairs, and has got a really strong track record of pushing the creation of cooperatives in developing countries, 
and I now go congratulations on the recent announcement of the presidency of CCOPA. Nico, welcome to the stage. Bueno, les voy a contar un poco cuál es la experiencia, eh, la experiencia de Mondragón eh, como, un, como un ejemplo de cooperativa industrial y de, y de escala. Espero que podamos tener la presentación, porque Peter ha sido muy estricto en cuanto al tiempo que tengo para, para hacer la presentación, solo 10 minutos, y así mis otros colegas pueden, pueden exponer también sus casos. Muy bien, mientras llega la presentación les, les cuento que eh, la experiencia cooperativa de Mondragón tiene ya más de 75 años. Eh, seguimos siendo a día de hoy la cooperativa industrial más grande del mundo. Eh, el hecho de que fuera industrial eh, fue, una, fue una necesidad, más que una, fue una necesidad mucho más que una opción que nosotros tuvimos porque el movimiento eh, se desarrolló en, en un ambiente industrial, ¿sí? en un ambiente de posguerra donde lo que había era una cultura industrial. Es decir, eh, básicamente como cooperativa y como valores eh, no somos muy distintos de la cooperativa agrícola que en Ruanda se dedica a la producción agraria. Lo que ocurre es que cada uno en su medio encuentra lo que... Uh, yes. Ah, good. Ahora por fin les voy a poder contar lo que tenía, lo que tenía previsto y no otra cosa. Bien, eh, un, unas cuantas ideas solamente. Nosotros decimos que la suma, la suma de muchos miembros, la suma multiplica. ¿sí? Nosotros somos muchas cooperativas muy diversas y creemos realmente que la suma cuando hay gente detrás, se convierte en una multiplicación. ¿sí? Mondragón representa a día de hoy un proyecto global. Nosotros estamos en más de 150 países con implantaciones en todo el mundo porque, porque estamos en negocios que son globales. Y lo que es muy importante es entender que una cooperativa puede ser y tener sus raíces muy profundas en el territorio en el que se desarrolla y, sin embargo, tener las ramas mirando a todo el mundo. Hoy en día no hay cosas locales ni hay cosas eh, globales. Todos somos globales. La economía y las personas se han convertido en vasos comunicantes. Mi compañero de mesa me estaba explicando cómo ellos traen el café de... De, de países como México y lo venden en Estados Unidos o como lo traen de África. Hoy en día todos somos personas y este es el concepto importante que yo les quiero decir y les quiero contar hoy. Que nuestro proyecto, la gran diferencia que tiene, no es en la dimensión, ni es en la, en la industria, ni es en los servicios. Es que está basado siempre en las personas. Si las personas van avanzando pueden llegar a ser de agricultores en un lugar, si tienen la oportunidad de tener una formación pueden ser ingenieros, pero lo importante son las ideas que hay detrás. El Grupo Mondragón tiene cuatro áreas de negocio, los números son antiguos, a día de hoy estamos facturando más de 12.000 millones de euros. Eh, el orden no es el adecuado porque el primer movimiento cooperativo que da que fue el germen del grupo, fue la universidad. El conocimiento es realmente importante. Después vino la industria, después las finanzas, que nos dieron la oportunidad de ser independientes y de no tener que depender del dinero de los otros. Y un tema muy importante es saber que el dinero es un medio y no es un fin. Y por fin la distribución. Eh, como les digo, más de 150 eh, plantas en todo el mundo, y estamos en los cinco continentes. Eh, bueno, además de los números que, que son grandes, yo destacaría dos cosas. Uno es el papel que tiene la universidad en nuestro grupo cooperativo y, por otro lado, los centros de investigación. 
nosotros eh, tenemos un triángulo virtuoso, no es un círculo, que está compuesto de una parte que es el negocio, otra parte que es la educación y otra que es la investigación. ¿sí? No se pueden entender los negocios de Mondragón sin tener en cuenta la formación. Nosotros tenemos nuestras propias universidades, pero como han dicho ya varios compañeros aquí, a día de hoy no vale con intercooperar dentro de nuestro ecosistema. Necesitamos intercooperar con otros. Nosotros estamos captando ingenieros de otras universidades, estamos colaborando con otros centros de investigación, pero sí es muy importante tenerlos dentro, porque el hecho de tener no solo industriales, sino tener investigadores y tener estudiantes y profesores es lo que hace que el resultado final sea realmente distinto. Bueno, estos son áreas estratégicas de negocio futuro. A mí me gustaría poner un, hablarles de un, de un ejemplo concreto. Cuando la gente habla de Mondragón, todo el mundo piensa que estos tuvieron suerte porque están en Europa, que es, es muy desarrollada. ¿no? Si estuviéramos en un país con menos... Lo gracioso del caso de Mondragón es que cuando realmente se generan más cooperativas y se fue realmente más activo, fue en los peores tiempos. La necesidad estimula el ingenio. Nuestro grupo se forma eh, después de una guerra civil. Cuando el otro día visitaba aquí el, el, el Museo del Genocidio, yo pensaba eh, ¿cuántas, similitud, cuántas similitudes tienen todas las culturas. Allí pasamos por una guerra civil y eso nos hizo ver que teníamos que unirnos y no enfrentarnos para conseguir cosas, para conseguir un futuro mejor. Ahora les voy a presentar eh, lo que es Munduquide. Munduquide es la ONG del Grupo Mondragón. La gente que trabaja aquí dona un dinero, se va de cooperante y lo que hacemos es ayudar a otros países del sur a formar cooperativas para que estas cooperativas generen desarrollo. Nosotros tenemos un sistema en el que tenemos donantes, tenemos participantes, tenemos la universidad, pero lo que quiero mostrarles es, ya que, la, ya que el encuentro era, era en África, he querido poner un, un ejemplo africano en Mozambique, pero tenemos otros en Colombia y en, otras, y en otras zonas que no tuvieron la suerte o que no tienen a día de hoy la suerte de vivir en una Europa desarrollada. Aquí lo que hacemos es desarrollar las comunidades y enseñarles a hacer cooperativa. Y como sé que tengo el tiempo bastante, bastante limitado, solo quiero decirles que una cooperativa como la nuestra, que es puramente industrial, lo que enseña no es a plantar, lo que enseña es a gestionar. Les voy a ir directamente a la última, si me deja el sistema. Bien, este es, este es uno. nosotros durante los últimos años hemos venido, hemos venido desarrollando un, proyectos en el mundo en los que hemos generado 80.000 empleos, de los cuales la mitad, este es solo uno, el de Mozambique, solo uno, la mitad son mujeres. Y el tema de género aquí es importantísimo porque las mujeres en los países de desarrollo son quienes sostienen las familias y sin las mujeres no podemos hacer futuro. Quisiera mostrarles simplemente el, el, el caso concreto del 2018 al 2022. Hemos pasado a tener muchísimas más hectáreas de cultivo y con una, con, un, con una inversión tan solo de 3 millones y medio hemos generado 25.000 puestos de trabajo y hemos generado 14 millones de ingresos a las personas que participan en el proyecto. Para un Mozambique, que es uno de los países más pobres del mundo, pasar de tener una renta eh, de un dólar a tenerla de dos es algo totalmente increíble y la satisfacción que produce poder aprovechar la experiencia, no para contársela a ustedes en estos congresos, que está fenomenal, pero para poder llevarla a, a otros terrenos y ver el resultado es totalmente satisfactorio. Muchas gracias. Thank you for struggling with the technology. It was probably my fault for the speakers. You press green to make the slides go forward. I've learned something. Um, our next speaker, thank you for that. Our next speaker is uh, Thalian Tremaine.
Fabian is the CEO and co-founder of the Pacamama co Coffee Cooperative of small-scale coffee producers. It's a federated cooperative. It represents almost a quarter of a million small-scale coffee farmers around the world. And based in California, it's the only coffee roaster in North America that is owned and governed by farmers in both Latin America and here in Africa. Falian has led coffee formations growth and creation since 2003. Falian's passion for a cooperative movement is strong and sincere. It began at an agricultural cooperative in rural Bolivia where he worked as a Peace Corps volunteer in the mid-1990s and in pursuit of a better ownership and governance structure for economic development as a dedicated advocate for a co-op movement and indeed for his own coffee business. Falian, over to you. Good morning. Thank you very much for this great opportunity and that great introduction, Peter. Uh, my name is Thalian Tremaine and I represent Pachamama Coffee Cooperative. We are a federated cooperative based in California, in uh, Sacramento, California to be exact. Pachamama is um, owned by producer groups in five different countries, Nicaragua, Mexico, Peru, Guatemala, and Ethiopia. Our mission is to serve premium coffee in the most direct way possible and in doing so, improve the lives of small-scale farmers around the world. <clears throat> a federated cooperative based in the United States, today we represent over 300,000 small-scale farmers around the world. We were established in 2006 and incorporated in California. So our strategy, simply put, is to sell directly to consumers. We organize farmers downstream, closer to the consumer, in order to capture more value and more profits for coffee farmers. So the services that we provide for our members include roasting, brewing, branding, packaging, marketing, and distribution of their best coffee. And we do this throughout the United States. We have two cafes uh, in California, and a third one on its way. So for just a moment, I'd like to talk about coffee and development. Coffee may be the world's most important agricultural product for economic development and environmental sustainability. I cannot think of a product that's more important. There are 1 billion cups of coffee consumed every day. That's a staggering number. This is a global market worth over $200 billion. 100 million people at origin rely on coffee income. Women own over 25% of the world's coffee farms. And the world's poorest countries rely heavily on coffee. Yet with all this value in the coffee world, over $200 billion, less than 10% of that value remains at origin. And what's worse is less than 2% of the actual profit made on coffee remains at origin. These are big problems. And just to illustrate that coffee is produced in countries with relatively low income. Um, so if you're a coffee producing country, I think the challenge is clear that we need to get a larger portion of coffee's true retail value and get it back to the producing country and the farmer as well. So, you know, in California, we sell lattes for $5. We recently raised the price from $4 and no one complained. We have lattes and other beverages that we sell for six and seven dollars. So it's really difficult to imagine that only 10 cents of that five dollars can make it back to the farmer. But that's the reality in today's coffee market. 
And for a lot of coffee farmers, in fact, they're probably only getting about one, two, or three pennies for every cup of coffee sold. Not every cup of coffee sells for $5, but the point is there's enormous value in coffee. So while the story is pretty, pretty dire for coffee farmers, I think it's very optimistic at the same time because there's a great deal of value in coffee. So Pachamama, we capture value downstream, simply put. We focus on high quality coffee roasting and packaging. We have a national distribution to wholesalers uh, and retailers throughout the United States. We have professional management based in California. We focus on marketing and branding and sales, relationships with customers. We identify and share market trends with our members. That's a valuable, valuable, um, service that we provide. And increasingly, we are focused on direct-to-consumer sales through the internet. We have a coffee subscription service where people buy their coffee from us on a monthly basis and it ships directly to their house and we capture 100% of that retail value, which at that price point is well over $20 a pound. Uh, as I mentioned, we operate two cafes in California. We sell a lot of lattes. And every day it seems like we're selling more. Uh, the demand is significant for high quality coffee. And I don't see that slowing down, as a matter of fact. Uh, development, uh, we focus on trying to develop new technologies and new opportunities to benefit our farmers. So we're very focused also on finding ways to use the internet, to use mobile technology, to link farmers with our customers, to get more money back to farmers, more information, and relationship directly between farmers and consumers. This year, on average, we, re we receive over $12 a pound for every coffee we roast. So back to the cooperative, uh, the governance of Pachamama. We are, again, as I mentioned, a federated cooperative. Our members themselves are often federated cooperatives. And each, each member owner of Pachamama has one vote on the board of directors. Our board is currently comprised of five member groups uh, as we have five members. That number will increase in the future as we add additional members from other countries. And the profits then are allocated as a percentage of the total coffee sold by each member. So if, if one cooperative from Nicaragua sold 25% of coffee in Pachamama, they would be entitled to 25% of the net profit. And, and that is allocated uh, according to the board of directors. And um, again, that board of directors is comprised solely of farmer representatives, five members, five board directors from five different countries. There's no one else on the board, so the farmers retain total ownership and complete control. So, there, so with uh, global value chains and cooperatives, I've, I believe that this innovative model can be applied to, to a lot of other products, not just coffee. Um, it makes a lot of sense for producers to be operating at the point of consumption. There's a great deal of investment being made in coffee. Last year, $600 million alone was invested in startups in the United States for coffee. So at this pace of investment, it's imperative that Producing nations and farmers find a way to continue to invest, but to invest further downstream. At least a portion of that investment should be closer to the consumer. Because when you get to the consumer, you've got the value. And in fact, I believe the consumer truly is your friend. Uh, and they've got $5 for a cup of latte. This is a scalable model. It just requires better access to capital and investors. I think farmers need two things. They need access to consumer markets, and then they need access to, to better uh, financing and capital. Uh, we've, we've solved the first problem in a sense, and we haven't quite figured out the, the funding part. But we're working on that, and as we grow and we sell more coffee, we, we're more profitable, we invest in ourselves, and we can uh, establish relationships with, with local financial institutions and investors. And again, this is a replicable model. So I believe this could be used for products like coffee, tea, honey, rice, and many other 
uh, commodities that are produced for low value and often sold at a high value. <clears throat> the, the lessons learned by Pachamama very quickly, members, you know, we needed members, we need members with a vision and members that participate. And fortunately, we have that. And that's a big key to success for Pachamama. It's our five member groups that participate and invest and have done so for 15 years. We have trust amongst members, not always easy, but very important. Professional management, we need to create, always create and maintain a unique brand. Brand equity is where the vast majority of, of value is created in coffee. Uh, to organize early on, we received grants from uh, Cooperative Development Foundation and the World Bank. And without that money, we, not, we would not have been able to organize the cooperative. <clears throat> that, that money did not uh, support launching and operating the business. Th those finances, those resources came from the members themselves. But to scale up, it's going to take more than the coffee farmers and their limited resources. We're going to need to find ways to find institutional support to support these kinds of models. So finally, I would just like to introduce you to you our president and co-founder, Merlene Presa. She's the, the general manager of Prodi Co-op in Nicaragua and represents 2,300 farm families in northern part of the country. Uh, a few years ago, someone asked her about Pachamama and her quote was, for small farmers, the Pachamama model is an evolution born from necessity and a strong determination to stay on the farm. So with that, I thank you for your time. Enjoy the conference. Thanks, Fabian. And they're, they're live examples of somebody who, frankly, has been there, seen it, and bought the T-shirt, dare I say. Um, one of the bits I took away from that, Fabian, which I think was great, was about farmers having access to consumer markets but also needing access to finance. And I know Steve Gill in the audience from Co-op Exchange, it's something he's working on, trying to get access to cooperative finance for cooperatives. Our next speaker I was fortunate enough to hear yesterday at one of the plenary sessions, um, Chris Ollick from Fairtrade Africa. Fairtrade Africa is the umbrella organization representing all Fairtrade certified producers in Africa. Chris has been involved in this since 2005 He's worked in many types of cooperative, setting environmental standards, sustainability initiatives for particularly tea and coffee worker plantations. He has a particular interest, and explained it extremely well yesterday, in strengthening the governance and leadership in cooperatives to really enable them to play their potential throughout the value chain. Chris, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you, Peter, uh, for that good intro. I think I'll pick it up from where my colleagues have left. And I just start with a quick introduction of fair trade. I know Peter has already done this. But for, uh, for those of you who may not know exactly what fair trade does, we are, fair trade Africa is part of the, 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 the global fair trade uh, movement that works in a number of con uh, in, in three continents uh, uh, across the globe. So Fair Trade Africa is the network that represents the producer organizations and workers within Africa. But we have another network for the Caribbean and Latin America, and yet another one for Asia and uh, the Pacific. So we are three networks across the globe, but part of the bigger Fair Trade movement. So in Africa, how are we spread? We work in uh, 50, uh, 34 countries in Africa that are spread across uh, South Africa. So we have a network that represents the South African region. We have uh, a network that represents the, North, uh, the Middle East and the North African region. We have a separate network that represents the Western Africa region. And now the, uh, the network that represents the Eastern and Central Africa region where I come from as a head of region. So we work with over 1.6 million producers and workers across uh, the globe, but 
over 70% of those, 1.1 million, come from Africa. And again, over 830,000 coming from the Eastern and Central Africa network. Yeah, so it's quite a big number that, that we are talking about. So how do we work? We, our entry point with the uh, certified uh, produce organizations in Africa is at the point of organizing them, to get them started, for them to be able to take up the certification system for the fair trade uh, standards. So we cannot certify any produce organization that stands alone. So they have to come around into uh, cooperatives. But of course, still riding on the very old a system of the, the a very old system of the membership and the, and the organization of the producer, producer, producers across the continent. So what we do is that we come in to support them with establishing of the management systems that will retain and help them sustainably comply with the fair trade standards. But after that is when our work starts. Because we realize producers still face a lot of challenges as you will be seeing and you have seen before across the continent. So bringing them together is one thing, but how do we get them going? So we have to come in as Fair Trade uh, Africa to build their capacity in terms of leadership, in terms of establishing management systems that are able to support the certification system, enabling them to be able to access uh, markets through market coaching sessions, through providing linkages, and being able you know, to create a network of a support system that can be able to enable them access the premium markets that they get through the fair trade certification. So if you look at the value chain, the way it is spread, we realize that there's still a lot more we need to do, and most much of it is in trying to create value across that value chain through the certification of the fair trade standards. So how do we do that? We have uh, come up with an, you know, a kind of a call, a rallying call for Fair Trade Africa to go beyond the certification standards. So we come in and uh, partner with like-minded organizations, community-based organizations, governments, nation, uh, both local and, and, and national, to be able to see how we can be able to create capacity within the produce organizations to access the markets and uh, claim ownership over the value chain because that is where the value lies. So across the value chain you will see kind of the producers are delinked from the rest of what happens beyond the production process. So the challenge we have had is in how we can be able to unlock value across that value chain. I just realized, Peter, uh, we uploaded the wrong, the wrong picture on the screen. Hang on two seconds. We have a technical error. Yeah, this is not the right. This, this is the wrong picture on the screen. Uh, can you go on without the presentation? Yeah, I have a screen light. Yeah. Do you want to try to switch it on? Yeah. Sorry, I think uh, the technical team put up a wrong presentation. It's not the one uh, I'm using. But I have a printout of this. Thank God you're prepared. It's all right. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you so much. Yeah, so what we are doing is that if you look at it broadly, you realize uh, our produce organizations are kind of at a crossroads because we, have we are facing the challenges of climate change, low pricing, volatility of, pri uh, of, of, of markets, low productivity, the aging producer, the notion, uh, the, the idea we have always, always been talking about, law, youth, and women involvement, and their participation across the value chain. So what we are trying to do as Fair Trade Africa, through partnerships, we partner with like-minded organizations to be able to strengthen these produce organizations along these specific aspects of the value chain. So whether it is in governance or leadership, to be able to strengthen their governance structures, we partner with other producer, uh, with other like-minded organizations to be able to create value around those specific aspects of the value chain. Whether it is about agronomic practices that are not supportive, 
that devaluate the production process and do not accrue value for the produce organizations, then we also partner with other CBOs, non-governmental organizations, and even governments to be able to create value around those uh, aspects of the value chain. So the model we are pursuing as Fair Trade Africa is to come up with an inclusive uh, farmer service business model. So we are working with one of the cooperatives to pilot on this to see how it turns out. So we have done quite a lot of work along this uh, process where we want to create value for the farmer, for the, for the produce organization, right from the seedling. So we are calling it the approach of seedling to cup, from seed to cup. So how does the value evolve? So if the co cooperatives are positioned well enough to be able to take custody and lock the value along the entire value chain, then what you are seeing is the unfair distribution of the returns, only leaving the farmers with 10% of what accrues in, in, uh, as profit, then we can be able to grow more value. So from the uh, cooperative societies that we have certified, we have encouraged one of them to develop a system of farmer service provision model. So they have all their membership locked down and signed up for the support of this cooperative society. So they will go in to support them, establish, establish proper tree nurs uh, I mean nurseries for their farms. If it is coffee, it is tea. They do a proper propagation system for them. They are able also to help them manage their tea bushes, their, their, their coffee bushes, and at the same time, they have set up a processing facility that is supported by all their members. And at the end of the day, they are able to lock that, that value through processing their own products, value adding, packaging, and delivering that to the market. So that at the end of the day, what you have is a composite of a, a value chain that is owned from production, processing to marketing by the producer organization. And we can be able to accrue much more benefits to them. So as a result, we are encouraging that for these cooperatives to be successful, we invest more around creating value in the final product because that is where the premium lies. We also encourage them through capacity building and empowerment to be able to create alliances and network and collaborate with other cooperatives across the globe and create proper linkages through their participation in global fairs to be able to interact more with the markets and learn more from the markets so that they can understand the market dynamics. That way, we can be able to assure value for the farmer, to assure value for the cooperative societies that are engaged in the value chain. So in that, I request to end with uh, just a, a, a small indication that yes, as fair trade, we have done that much, but there's still much more to be done. Because if you look at the cooperative societies and how we work with them, we still have a lot of work to be done. And a rallying call to you is that we keep this going, we collaborate more, we partner more to be able to grow value for these producers. Thank you so much. Feeling of relief when you realize the next speaker hasn't got slides, it's quite a lot. Um, so, first and foremost, thank you, Chris. That was good. And I think the call for action from Chris, principle six, cooperation amongst cooperatives, came through loud and clear. For introduce our next speaker, it is right to say thank you for the hospitality of Rwanda and Rwandan people. Jean Bosco Halimana works and is currently the Director General of the Rwandan Cooperative Agency since May 2018 to date. And John Bosco, thank you on behalf of all of us as delegates here for Rwandan hospitality. 
Since January 2006, John Bosco has been a lecturer at high learning institutions in Rwanda, in Senegal, and Benin. And I'm sure we'll give a different take on the principles of the policies underpinning this value throughout the service chain. John Bosco. Uh, good morning, everyone. As said by Peter, I'm uh, Jean Bosco. I'm the Director General of Rwanda Cooperative Agency, which is a public institution in charge of promotion, registration, and regulation of cooperatives. By now in Rwanda, we have uh, 9,506 cooperatives uh, divided in a different value chain, such as tea, coffee, horticulture, uh, transport, uh, minerals, and so on. Uh, uh, focusing on strategic positioning in the value chain, uh, as we know, uh, several cooperatives experienced significant changes in the market structure and competition. The agribusiness sector has tradition been regarded as a fragmented industry, characterized by regional uh, dispersion and limited across the national activity. Today, the market uh, we are in an obligation to respond uh, to the needs of the market by increasing, by improving the quality, because as we know, our farmers, uh, producers in the cooperatives, uh, they are not uh, strong enough to compete with other on the market. Uh, this open new opportunities as uh, the greater uh, to ask to put other requirement to improve uh, the quality of standards of services and products produced by cooperatives. Uh, here in Rwanda, we uh, have uh, we have primary cooperatives, we have unions, we have federation. A uh, union, by law, is a business entity uh, formed by three or more cooperatives, uh, but to be accepted, it must be uh, shown that it will bring an added value to those uh, primary cooperatives. For example, let's take an example. Uh, a coffee, uh, co co three uh, coffee uh, cooperatives, together, one by one, they cannot, for example, uh, be able to form, uh, to have a coffee washing station. But by uh, forming a union, the target is a union as a business entity which will run a coffee washing station, then it will, be, it will bring an added value uh, to those primary cooperatives. It is in this spirit, we have 182 uh, unions in Rwanda, and their aim is to add the quality, uh, add the value to primary cooperatives. Then, by law, three uh, union or more, they form a federation. And you cannot have a federation in uh, two federations in the same value chain. For example, maize value chain has one federation. Cassava, one federation. Tea, one federation. Coffee, minerals, those are, it is what uh, the way we the movement, the cooperative movement, is structured. The quality standard uh, increase of traditional food products and the competitive advantage positioning needed have consequences uh, for the structure, structuring and the management of the whole value chain. It is in this spirit, we, the, one of the requirement of a union is to respond to the standard uh, required by Rwanda Standard Board, uh, especially in agriculture, in services, in, uh, in a different uh, economic lives where we have uh, cooperatives. As mentioned by uh, the Minister of uh, Local Government, uh, the 
economic lives of the, this country mainly is based on the cooperatives. We work together with uh, the local government uh, to promote first, to have a participation of members, uh, but also uh, if they would like to invest or to be together in X, Y, X, uh, value chain, we show them those, the, the, the requirements. And then from there, we organize trainings to uh, up, up, upgrade, improve the, let's say, skills or knowledge uh, to compete on the market with uh, abroad uh, other uh, product from uh, outside. Uh, then, uh, cooperatives members first should have a clear target uh, and have the spirit of joining efforts with the main goal of achieving the ambition, which is to have a strong, well-managed, well-governed cooperative. An important challenge is the quality dimension uh, included in such advent advanced product concept demand adaptation for the production throughout the value chain. Uh, here we realize that, for example, in the cassava value chain, there are those products uh, come from, let's say, because we are Kenya, Tanzania, they are the neighbors, but they are, they, let's say they have uh, good products. To compete with them, we need uh, to sometimes to imitate, to show them those new technologies, and then compete. Uh, we consider both the competitive uh, positioning tools and the resources configuration of the value chain necessary for creating sustainable competitive advantage for cooperatives within uh, different segments. To address the issue of uh, this competition uh, and also the persistence of trade balance, which is always negative in Rwanda, the government strategizes first on made in Rwanda. Uh, by achieving this made in Rwanda, one of the tools to be strained is a cooperative. Then we uh, bring all necessary to train, to coach, uh, to upgrade, to organize well cooperatives. It is a reason why uh, even we have this uh, public institution uh, dedicated uh, to regulate, uh, to promote uh, cooperatives. Uh, then, uh, through uh, Rwanda Cooperative Agents and the National Agriculture Export Board, we help cooperatives in trainings and other uh, possible uh, strategies uh, in different aspects uh, to, advise, to, uh, to advise them to produce more, but with quality then to uh, uh, increase the notion of quality in every step they make. Addition to this, the government sets, uh, not government, because through unions, there are industries, factories around the cooperatives where they can assess any services cheaply and quickly as much as possible. In the competition market, uh, with uh, increasing internal rivalry, uh, the producers need to develop additional tools in order to secure future competition advantage. It is in this spirit uh, we have uh, so many uh, tours in country or outside to imitate, to copy with our where there is our best practices. Uh, in particular, when uh, cooperatives, as uh, you know, or unions, they need financial resources. Here in Rwanda, we have 487 uh, circles dedicated to finance uh, non-financial cooperatives in a different value chain. Uh, but also, we have uh, uh, Bank, uh, Bank Rwandaise de Développement. Uh, a develop this, this is a, a development bank uh, to finance uh, those initiatives from cooperatives. Then uh, the, uh, what the investment is 
a common, uh, we have a common inspection, Rwanda Standard Board, a National Agriculture Export, if it is in agriculture, a Rwanda Cooperative Agents, to make sure that the investment made is in line with the government policy. Uh, then with this, hopefully our cooperatives, uh, primary, union, federation, uh, we would like to see them uh, the strong one, and then to see uh, members of cooperatives happy with their investment because they, they can choose, they choose to invest through cooperatives. And then you have to ensure that what they produce are, are respond to the market needs, the market standards, and this is uh, our mandate. I thank you so much for the time. Thank you. Thank you, Jean Bosco. Um, our final speaker, and I'm delighted to welcome, is the president of the Korean Federation of Worker Co-ops. Kang Tae Park represents a worker co-op with a, with a focus on engaging colleagues the three franchises throughout the value chain on cooperative principles and cooperative values. Kang Tae, delighted to welcome you. Hello everyone, good morning. Okay. My name is Kang Tae Park, President of Korea Federation of Worker Cooperatives. I'm very happy to present the experience of my cooperative, Happy Bridge. Happy Bridge means that we should be a bridge to a happy world. And we believe the worker cooperative model could be a great bridge to make worker happier. Happy Bridge's main business is a restaurant franchise. Its members are workers who work in the franchiser. Currently, there are more or less 100 worker members. Happy Bridge has six business fields and has more than 600 franchise restaurants, which are clients of cooperative. Through these restaurants, Happy Bridge is providing more than 2,500 jobs on top of 100 workers in Happy Bridge. Its total turnover is 300 million US dollar. This is a simply picture to explain value chain around Happy Bridge. A restaurant franchise business has to take care of different levels of value chain from food ingredients to restaurants through processing and logistics. Happy Bridge is trying to manage directly some parts of value chain. And in this way, it can provide better goods and services to their client restaurants with better price. Currently, our client restaurants purchase 20% of food ingredients directly from local markets or wholesale stores. Thank you. And 80% is provided by the logistics of Happy Bridge. And it also wants to produce directly some strategic materials. Today, Happy Bridge is producing 30 or 40% processed materials in its own food plant. 
In addition, Happy Bridge has tried to develop cooperative and social values, such as safe food, eco-friendly and organic food, contribution to local community, and development of cooperative model throughout its value chain. Food plant is a good item to expand businesses of Happy Bridge and also to guarantee the quality and safety of the products. Today, Happy Bridge has three factories and expect that more factories would be created in near future. Using our experience of log logistics, Happy Bridge has been expanding eco-friendly food delivery service to managing a community catering center in Dongdaemun district to, together with a consumer cooperative. Happy Bridge started promoting cooperative restaurants for and by young people in 2014. The Five is a brand designed for fast food restaurant. Five restaurants were incubated by Happy Bridge, but unfortunately, they were closed after two years. It is an experience and history of a failure from which we need to learn. Happy Bridge tried to make a new business too. One of them is HBM Cooperative Management Institute, which was established through collaboration with Mondragon University in 2015. HBM means Happy Bridge and Mondragon. Today, HBM Institute opened Mondragon Team Academy course in Seoul and operates it together with Mondragon University. Happy Rich also incubated successfully a travel agency worker cooperative, Happy Cook Tour. There are so many international meetings and study trips in the cooperative and social economy sector. Happy Cook Tour Cooperative has grown up year by year. Of course, in this process, Happy Bridge Cooperative also has tried to collaborate with agriculture, fishery, and consumer cooperatives in different ways. Now, my presentation is ended but Happy Bridge Challenges will continue. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Kang Tae. Um, I think it's fair to say all five speakers have given a different perspective on how we add value to the supply chain. Um, one of the great beauties of these sessions, I think, is then the panel debate and getting that interaction. So have we questions from the audience on this? So if we take the question down the front, if you can wait till the microphone comes from Bernadette, if we take one down the front first, if we can, and then we'll come across to a gentleman in a blue shirt in the middle, Helen, if we can do that. So the, the lady in the third row, Brenda. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Pete, and, and thank you for all the presentations. I have um, two questions and comments, for one for Chris and one for, for the DG of uh, Rwanda Co-op um, Agency. Uh, for Chris, I, I, I want to check with you, Chris, um, whether are you, how are you linked with the, the global gap standards? Because um, 
you're talking about free trade, but uh, free trade has also uh, is supposed to be in line with the, the global gap standards. So how do you also facilitate that the local producers is in any country is aligned uh, to the, the, the gap uh, uh, standards? Regarding um, the, the, the Rwanda agency, I, I think you'll, you'll agree with me that um, compliance with standards and quality is very expensive. So I want to, because co-ops must first comply with the, 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 the country standards and, and also comply with, with the global standards. Uh, which both levels require some in injection of finances, you know, for the product itself and also for the processes and procedures of the production. So how do you fund your cooperatives? Because we have seen very beautiful, uh, good products from a lot of uh, co-ops from Rwanda. So perhaps you can learn from that. I know you said you have institutions but even in our countries, we have institutions, but access to those funds and uh, to, to know what quality standards to comply with, it's a serious challenge. So perhaps if you can share with us. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Chris, perhaps if you repeat the question and then give the answer if we can from a fair trade Africa point of view. So much for the question. Yeah, I think uh, if I get the question right, we are trying to to to, to find out what fair, uh, the relationship we have with the the, the global gap standard. But uh, just to tell you that a fair trade uh, standard is one of the voluntary social and environmental standards, among so many others. So we have quite an array of standards out there. Fair trade being one of them. But the standard is anchored on a number of aspects that will really incorporate part of what you will still find in the global gap standard. So if you look at the spectrum of the standard, we have a social component that looks into mainly the, the, the socio-economic welfare of, of, of the workers and the producers and the members of certified produce organizations. We have uh, the economic arm of the standard that is angered on the prudent management of the fair trade premium because it's certification to fair trade standards give you access to fair trade premium, which is then invested back into the communities and the workers to social develop uh, them and, and, and be able to enable them access uh, sustainable livelihoods. But you also have part of the standard anchored on environmental uh, aspects making sure that we, we maintain the environmental integrity that goes with ethic, ethical production. But again, as part of the standard, we have a trade aspect, a trade component that will guarantee the assurance that any trade relations that the certified producer organizations develop with any trader are fairly done. So it is making trade fair, empowering those in the value chain, the workers and the producers, and guaranteeing sustainable livelihoods. So generally that is the scope of our standard fair trade standard. So in, within the fair trade standard, you still find a number of components of what you will still get in these other standards out there. Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and Jim Bosco, in terms of um, compliance again with standards and compliance with cultural standards in particular, I guess. Thank you for the Hello, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, it is true to comply with the standard. It is so expensive. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, here in Rwanda, we have uh, Made in Rwanda program. In this Made in Rwanda program, we have uh, also another program, Hanga Umurimo. Hanga Umurimo in, in English is uh, 
creation of uh, job, job creation program. Those two programs, uh, we have a window, a, spe a specific window dedicated to cooperatives. Where uh, to start, if you'd like to start a business through cooperatives, we have a specific team from Rwanda a Standard Board to start to, uh, uh, to start with you. And uh, they have also in Rwanda Standard Board a program uh, called Zamu uh, Kanuzira Nenje, which is, uh, if I may translate well, uh, grows, grow with uh, standards or start with the standard. They start with you and they show you how to do, they, they are with you. And uh, we have so many uh, field staff to work with the farmers uh, to respond uh, directly uh, to the challenge related to standards, to compete with those uh, products with the high standard, and then to protect our cooperatives and SMEs. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I believe we had a gentleman in the middle. There's a quest question from sir? No, okay. Uh, yes, just onto his feet now. Sorry. Hello. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Innocent Ndikumana, a lecturer at the uh, University of the Adventist of Chigari in Milak, uh, especially in the Department of uh, Cooperative Management and Accounting. Uh, my question goes to the Director General of Rwanda Cooperative Agency. Uh, as you said, it's uh, universally acknowledged that uh, cooperatives play a key role in the development of uh, the country, both at the micro and macro level as far as socioeconomic development is concerned. Uh, but cooperative managers need, need to have skills. They need to have some skills in the areas related to cooperative management, cooperative accounting, even other related areas. Some universities have undertaken to integrate cooperative management programs within their programs of teaching. Uh, especially in areas related to cooperative management, governance, microfinance management, uh, business, social entrepreneurship, business planning, strategic management, and so on. But the, the problem is that uh, their profiles are not in the mainstream of uh, positions uh, regarding cooperative management uh, as far as recruitment is concerned. So I would like to ask the Director General uh, of Rwanda Cooperative Agency uh, his take on that. Thank you. Thank you for that. So the, the question is around co-op management and education and what provision, I guess, from uh, Rwanda. Uh, Jean Bosco, if we start with you, but I'd like to widen that out to the panel as well, if we can. Thank you so much. It is a good question. Uh, we know uh, that as he, uh, said, uh, the role of cooperative is uh, crucial, uh, especially in any uh, de developing countries or developed countries at micro, meso, and macro level. Managers, as he said, need uh, skills, knowledge, and uh, attitude to be professional, to act professionally. Uh, it is in this spirit in Rwanda we sensitized so uh, different high learning institutions and universities, such as UNILAC, Ines uh, University of Rwanda. They started uh, a program at bachelor level, at master's level, but also they have a specific centers, professional centers, uh, which uh, can offer uh, the short courses, and uh, we appreciate the initiative. By now in Rwanda, uh, we started to recruit uh, the qualified uh, managers uh, from those universities. Uh, it is uh, 
uh, it has the results, uh, and we will continue to encourage uh, but, uh, students to join those programs, but also uh, those high learning institutions and universities, even those professional centers, uh, to continue pushing to have uh, professional uh, employees or workers in the cooperatives. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Enego, you, you spoke in terms of Mondragon about having the, the business, the information, but education being important. Um, how do you see your role throughout the value chain in learning and development in cooperative education? Yes. Well, hopefully in a second, if we can get the microphone. Okay, so Okay, ya. Yeah. Sí, muchas gracias. Bien, en, en, el, en la cadena de valor es muy importante también la formación cooperativa. Eh, aquí se ha hablado de lo importante que es tener contabilidad, todos los departamentos. Eh, nosotros trabajamos la cadena de valor humana desde el comienzo. Tenemos escuelas cooperativas... Eh, desde los dos años, tenemos eh, todo el ciclo hasta los 18 años, tenemos universidades eh, cooperativa, tenemos formación continua cooperativa para los trabajadores socios y para los que no lo son, para que entiendan la diferencia entre una sociedad normal eh, digamos estándar una compañía y una sociedad cooperativa y siempre hablamos de la cadena de valor desde el punto de vista de, eh, económico pero se nos olvida hablar de la cadena de valor de los valores sin cooperativistas decía don José María Arizmendiarrieta no hay cooperativas no nos podemos centrar solo en las leyes que son muy importantes en el financiamiento que también lo es, nos olvidamos habitualmente de los cooperativistas. Por eso la formación es tan importante, porque a nuestros niños tienen que entender que hay una manera de hacer las cosas que es distinta y nosotros con toda humildad pensamos que es mejor y que tiene que ver con los valores. Y estamos hablando de solidaridad y eso hay que aprenderlo y tenemos que aprender y enseñar hacer cooperativa. Uh, that's a great answer, thank you. And, and it is, I guess, central to this. Um, Felian, you, you must have had great experience in the, the education side when you're setting up cooperatives. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. I believe that Education throughout the supply chain, the value chain, has been a great investment. Um, in, 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 uh, starting with the farmer, but all the way through to the consumer. So if you look at the consumer, clearly there's a lot, lot to be learned about where their coffee is coming from and a lot of um, interest in learning that. So we, we, and that helps us sell coffee. So that's a, that's a smart investment. Um, and it, with staff, they don't necessarily know what, understand cooperatives that well, so we need to invest a great deal in, in teaching our staff. And as they learn, they can teach the customers. Uh, so that's a great investment. Um, lately, we've been investing in um, educating our board directors, because now we've got a cooperative with, these, with the boardroom full of, of people that don't necessarily know or don't have the experience as, as board directors. So that's, that's an important part of this learning process for Pachamama and for, for our members is learning how to run a, a company in the United States and uh, you know some of the big decisions that need to be made that, that need to be made at the board level. And of course, um, you know, it really all starts with the farmer. So getting as much information back to the farmer as possible and, and helping the farmer understand what adds value to their coffee today. Not what added value 10 years ago. 10 years ago, everyone's talking about quality in the cup. I think it's quality of image, quality of narrative, quality of authenticity. And those are the, the aspects that the, the farmer and their cooperatives need to, to understand. 
And if they better understand that, they can deliver uh, a more value-added product at the end. That's a good answer. Kang Tay, I guess from a worker co-ops perspective, education of the worker cooperatives and cooperators is absolutely key. Can you talk a bit about how important you believe learning and development of worker cooperatives are? Yes, uh, I think uh, education is uh, important things uh, that uh, is helpful to grow uh, every member's leadership. Uh, if somebody to tell somebody question to me, what kind of important thing uh, of leadership? Uh, I think I can say leadership uh, primary. Uh, things are communication and vision. Leaders should try to uh, communicate with members about what, what leader thinking, what leader doing, and leader uh, ha has tried to find out their uh, purpose, where, uh, what we should do, and where uh, should we go. Uh, she, uh, he, uh, he or she, leaders tried uh, that. Thank you. That's great. And Chris, finally for yourself, you, you talked eloquently and well yesterday about leadership amongst those setting up cooperatives. Perhaps a few words on the importance of that and how you help facilitate it. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think uh, I already mentioned this, but just to emphasize again that uh, cooperatives, if you look at the way they operate, it tells you a lot about the lack in capacities, especially around leadership. And uh, the bigger challenge, as already has been mentioned, about the levels of education of the people who take up leadership roles at the cooperative societies and the glaring gaps in governance issues, organizational development. So those are key components of the capacities that we need to focus on to be able to strengthen the running of the affairs of the cooperatives, which really will be more of enabling them to sustain themselves. So as fair trade, what we do we have tools that enable us to assess the, the professionalism and the maturity of the organizations that are certified to fair trade, and we'll put them at different levels, which will be a pointer of where we, have, where we can be able to get in, at what level do we start with this cooperative to be able to strengthen their leadership capacities, to be able to develop their skills and knowledge, be able to strengthen their internal management systems and controls, to enable them to carry on the business of, of cooperative societies. So there's so much that has to go into that. Thank you. And as we said earlier, I, I think the track record of cooperators and cooperatives in learning and development and education is strong. But there's always more we can do, I guess, and that's, that's one of the principles. Um, we've probably got time for one or two more questions. We have a gentleman right in the front. And a woman in the oh, sorry, I do apologize. We have the lady first. Thank you so much for your um, impressive presentation and uh, it was really insightful. My question was related to wealth versus uh, well-being. So uh, especially referring to Mondragon, uh, you did mention that in Mo Mozambique uh, we did see an increase in uh, income, in wealth, uh, and there are a lot of women already working there. So uh, how, how does it, how does this this wealth get translated into well-being. I'm asking uh, based on my personal experience because uh, the, the cooperatives where I worked, the women got money, they got access to finance, but they couldn't use it because they didn't have access to uh, decision-making in their own household. They were victims of violence. They did not have, uh, they were not literate. They, they didn't have much awareness how to use this money and invest in their own business. So. Um, it's open to all, but uh, I'm very curious to understand how this wealth is getting translated into uh, well-being of women in your businesses. Thank you. Uh, 
Bueno, nosotros pensamos que el empleo en sí mismo ya es, un, es la mejor fórmula para, para reducir las diferencias. ¿sí? ¿Qué quiere decir esto? Si no generamos... Nosotros vivimos en un mundo global, como he explicado antes, y nosotros tenemos eh, muchísimos clientes y hacemos dinero a través de vender a muchas compañías que no son cooperativas. La experiencia que nosotros trasplantamos es que exactamente igual eh, que puede pasar en muchos países, la situación de la mujer en el comienzo del movimiento cooperativo en España era la siguiente. Eh, una mujer joven podía trabajar fabricando una lavadora que después ella no tenía permiso para comprar porque le hacía falta el permiso de su marido. Esto era así en la España de hace 70 años. ¿sí? Nosotros no, no aspiramos a cambiar los sistemas políticos que dependen de cada uno de los países. Lo que sí tenemos es una relación directa entre la densidad cooperativa y la disminución de diferencias sociales. Es decir, eh, allá donde más cooperativas hay, hay muchos más eh, ingresos y, por tanto, la situación no solo de la mujer, sino de los niños y, en general, mejora. ¿sí? Pero esto está basado en dos principios fundamentales. Uno, la escala retributiva dentro de las propias cooperativas no puede superar una, eh, es decir, un, una proporción. Nosotros inicialmente la teníamos de 1 a 3 y ahora es de 1 a 7. El presidente de la Corporación Mondragón puede ganar 7 y la persona que menos gana, gana 1. Y esto es un tema fundamental. Yo ayer me quedé muy impactado por el, el discurso de la doctora eh, Shiva eh, y uno de los temas que hablaba citando a Gandhi era que, que el mundo tiene, tiene bienes para proveer a todos sus habitantes, pero no tiene suficiente para proveer la avaricia de unos pocos. El tema de la distribución es fundamental y otro es la solidaridad. Aquí podemos tener o hablar de negocios de café, de té, eh, de industria, el que sea. Pero tenemos que ser conscientes de que la suerte es un factor muy importante. De modo que si yo tengo una cooperativa que funciona muy bien y una cooperativa que funciona muy mal, probablemente no sea solo culpa de los cooperativistas. Y tener reglas no vale solo con asociarse. Hay que tener reglas de solidaridad intercooperativa para repartir los fondos y los beneficios. Porque si no se hacen fondos, lo que estamos dejando es no ser solidarios y que cada uno compite y se va bien y si no, ya está. Gracias. Um, this is to Mondragon. In the recent years, two, three, four years ago, many NGOs are moving and becoming experts of transforming community groups into cooperatives overnight. And I, I just said that they form an NGO and they're helping, using to help communities to form cooperatives. The challenge is that because the people trying to help communities form cooperatives, especially here in Africa, themselves do not have the expertise or experience in cooperatives. It's affecting the ability of those community groups to actually grow into viable, sustainable cooperatives. What have you done differently, which could be a lesson for the number of NGOs trying to do so in Africa? And finally, for the cooperative Pechamama, um, your president is very good at tweeting embargoes, economic embargoes these days. What if he, overnight you woke up and there was a tweet about economic embargo on Nicaragua? How does Pechamama deal with that? Thank you. We take, take the answers, I guess, in reverse order almost, if we can. Failium first, and then perhaps if we can do just one very short answer. So the question, if I understand it correctly, is what, what would happen in the case of an embargo with Nicaragua? Uh, well, the fortunate thing for Pachamama is that we've got five members from five different countries, 
And in fact, we can source coffee from anywhere we need to when necessary. So in the event that we, we lose access to one of our members, for example, this has happened in Peru, as a matter of fact, we can, we can substitute that with other coffee from Peru or simply uh, use coffee from Nicaragua or Mexico. Because the customer, our customer doesn't really, um, they don't necessarily care where the coffee's coming from always, but that it's coming from Pachamama. So it's a blended coffee and so forth. <clears throat> it might have some, of course, an embargo would have a, a great impact on our, on our members, but I think this is why our members are diversified and that why they've joined collectively so that if any one group falters, the group is stronger. You know, it wouldn't make sense for a Nicaraguan co-op to just go start roasting coffee in the United States by themselves. For, for the simple fact that it's, it's risky to do that for, for reasons that you mentioned, but also the, the customer wants much more option than just one coffee. Thanks, Fabian. No, respondiendo, sí, respondiendo a la pregunta, eh, yo creo que la ha respondido antes y, y la respuesta es solidaridad. Eh, cuando nosotros hablamos de solidaridad intercooperativa, hablamos de ceder fondos de unas cooperativas a otras, pero siempre de un, dentro de un grado de, de bienestar que es europeo y que nosotros vemos que es mucho mejor que el que hay en África, por ejemplo. Por eso luego llamamos a la solidaridad de nuestros socios y yo llamo a la, a la suya también para ser miembros de Munduquide y lo que hacemos es pedimos donaciones para que luego haya gente que enseñe a cooperar y pueda ayudar a determinada gente que no ha tenido esa suerte a tener un mejor futuro en África. Gracias. Thank you for that and thank you to all our, our panel. Um, I found that fascinating. I have learned an awful lot. I think we've heard, and I'm sure you'll agree, from a range of inspiring speakers, and perhaps if I can ask you just to show your appreciation to the speakers. I think, I think it's evident that the cooperative approach provides a much more balanced and positive impact throughout the value chain beyond just profits. Cooperatives should work together. We all know about principle six. We all talk about principle six. But I think our speakers have demonstrated the power of principle six, cooperatives working together. And also the principle of education. Cooperative education is vital for every continent and every cooperative, particularly at worker level, particularly at board level, at all levels. And it's by doing that I genuinely believe cooperatives can add value throughout the value chain and I genuinely believe that cooperatives have played their part and will continue to play their part to all the sustainability development goals, but in particular sustainability development goal 12 about responsible consumption and production. Thank you. Before we leave and before I close, a reminder there are three parallel sessions starting at half past two. The ones yesterday were fantastic. I'm sure the ones today will be equally as good. Uh, in this room, parallel five is around food security. Parallel six is around health, industrial and services reducing inequalities in room MH1. And in room MH3 is housing and energy. And of course, this evening at eight o'clock, we have the gala dinner and the Rochdale Awards. And I look forward to seeing all of you later today. Thank you.